Hi, Brian James, the Micro Four Thirds guy from Brian James Photography here with this week's little chat. And in this one, I'm going to be telling you how you can save thousands of pounds by understanding three little words. Join me. Well, yes, Brian James here from Brian James Photography. And as I say, I can tell you in this how to save thousands of pounds just by understanding three little words. And I've also got a little bit of bad news at the end as well. So it's been a, an interesting couple of days. So how can I save you thousands and thousands of pounds? Well, I'm going to tell you a bit of advice. The best bit of advice I've ever ignored. And I got it 40 years ago. 40 years ago when I was just a teenager I was uh, I used to frequent a photography club at school we had a fantastic teacher and at that time I used to borrow my father's Zenit E camera it was a great big tank like 35mm um, camera single lens reflex and it had uh, a 50mm lens on the front I think it was about f2.5 and I was looking around at some of my friends who had a little bit more money than I did and they all had fancy cameras and those cameras used to, uh, used to have some interesting lenses with them as well. Well, I couldn't afford them. So I was determined I wanted to, to get myself a better lens and I chatted to my teacher about it. And he turned around to me and gave me some of the best advice I've ever ignored. He said, you need to learn the difference between three words, like, want, and need. He said, you might like something, you might like the idea of it, but if you like it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to do you any good whatsoever. It's just something that you aspire to own. You'll tell people that you want something and you'll build up the want in your head. It'll be something that you really think is going to be something as special and important. You don't actually need it though. A need comes when a role cannot be fulfilled by what you've got. The need to actually have something to fulfill a job which you can't do at the moment. So what does that mean? Well, very, very simply pointed out to me, what, you've got a 50 millimeter f2.5 lens on that. He said, have you learned everything that that can do? Have you taken it to its limits? Have you totally exhausted everything that that lens can do? If you haven't, it's a want, not a need. Until you have exhausted everything that you can do on that lens, it's still just a want. You want something different, but your photography hasn't actually reached that point yet. And that's really important when we're buying gear. If we get this gear acquisition syndrome, the gas as they call it, it's fabulous, it's great. You can go out and buy yourself the newest fascist camera, which has got the best facilities on it, all the best features, the newest lens, which will take you down to F point whatever. But if you don't shoot into those limitations, then it's just a want. It doesn't have a need. And it was a really important piece of advice. And unfortunately, I, I, like most people, I failed to follow it. I went through life thinking about, well, that really looks nice. I can afford this now. And never totally get to the point where I've exhausted all the possibilities of what I have. Now, I've talked a few times on this channel about why I like the idea of kit lenses. Most of us are not professional photographers. We never will be. I've been lucky enough to actually make some money out of my profession as a photographer in the past. I've done press photography, I've done portraiture, I've done high volume stuff with schools, I've done an awful lot of um, commercial photography, and on those you do push yourself to the limits on what you need. If you've got 1500 school kids going through in a day, you need equipment which is going to be reliable, which is going to give you the results spot on consistently every time, whether it's a camera, the lens, the lighting, the backgrounds, whatever it is. But if you're taking just the odd shot of your family, do you really need all that? Can you get away with just a simple strobe light rather than full studio strobe equipment? More than likely, yes. In fact, 
Even with what I do shoot, quite often I will use an inexpensive strobe light. It does what I need it to do. So how is this saving you thousands? And how didn't it save me thousands? Well again, I get caught up in the, all the advertising, all the marketing, all the hype. I need the latest autofocus, which will autofocus in micro parts of a second compared to the previous model. And I'll trade my previous model in and take a loss on it because I paid the tax which I won't get back and the depreciation on the camera to get that little tiny degree of a difference. And how many times have you done that and realised that you can't actually tell the difference in normal use anyway? I'm shooting this on a 20 megapixel camera, my Lumix G9. I've also got an Olympus OMD EM1, which is 16 megapixels. And do you know, none of my clients can tell the difference. If I really start to push things to the limits, maybe they can. But we get fascinated by that bigger number. We get fascinated by the faster lens. Is this an f1.4 or an f1.8? Do we really need that 0.4? Is it something we're going to tell? And can we do it in other ways? Can we do it with, say, Photoshop or something like that ilk? More than likely, yes. In fact, a friend of mine did some photographs the other day, some portraits, and he was shooting on, I think it was probably an f4.5 uh, on his lens. And it gave a moderately creamy, nice background to it. We went to Photoshop and got a far better background than I've managed on an awful lot of my really fast lenses for years. The technology is changing. So if you want to save thousands, don't necessarily go out and buy something new because you can afford it or because you want it. Go out and buy it because you've exhausted the possibilities of what you have already. Use the lens that you have to its maximum. Find out its full limitations. Take it to its extremes. Take it slightly past its extremes and see where the cutoff point is. It's amazing what you can do, but also be realistic. If you're just going to be posting things on social media, do you need a 45 megapixel camera which is going to give you huge, great big um, raw files, which of course take up disk space and take up a lot of time to actually process and improve? It's up to you. I'm not saying don't buy good equipment. Good equipment is well worth it because it should last, but it's not necessarily a need. So moving on, we said about good equipment. Well, my very first Micro Four Thirds lens was uh, just as I was getting into it. I bought an OMD EM5 just to see, a second hand one, just to see what it was like, to see if it was worth actually investing anything into this little tiny format. You know, this one that doesn't do professional shots, but it does really, but it's just a little format. And rather than splash out on all sorts of lenses, I just bought the a Panasonic GX1 which had a kit lens on it and didn't really want to use a GX1 although I do use it quite a lot now but that kit lens was the little 14 to 42 G Vario um, f3.5 to 5.6 wonderful little lens but cheap plastic plastic fantastic really it's the kit lens which comes with it and I got some fantastic shots and it was the very thing which made me go to the point where now I'm packing up the last of my Canon gear to send off I'm selling it. I'm going totally for Micro Four Thirds. And what was it that was special about that lens? It was small, it was light, it was efficient, it gave great picture quality for, the, for what it was, and it was wonderful. It was robust until today. Unfortunately, I had it in a pocket. Be careful when you put things in pockets. Don't forget to zip them up. And as I turned around, I just heard a little clattering noise, looked down, and there was my lens bouncing along the ground. Unfortunately, it had landed right on the plastic mount, which decided it didn't want to stay in one piece anymore. So I've had to say bye-bye to my 14 to 42. Oh, never mind. Um, the other thing is though, because as I say, I'm getting rid of my Canon gear, I'm, tra I'm trading in my 5D after some fantastic service, but I'm trading it in, I'm going for a GX8. Again, second-hand camera. I'm really into the idea of second-hand equipment if it's well used and bought from a reputable supplier. So I'm buying a GX8, and I'm also buying to go along with it the little 17mm Olympus Prime. Fantastic little lens. If you read the reviews, it's supposed to be great. So when I get that, I'm going to let you see it as well. So what else have I been doing? Well, it's been Easter. You wouldn't believe it. It's freezing. It's been a lovely sunny Easter, but unfortunately the temperature in the UK has been incredibly cold. I'm standing here with my jacket on, really, really cold. 
So we've been out, I've been to Brampton Junction for the second time. I went there a couple of weeks ago when it was pouring down the rain, but since the sun came out, I went to Brampton Junction this time to look at the Dandy Line. Now the Dandy is a little railway line which runs down between Brampton Junction, where the railway goes from Newcastle to Carlisle, down into the town. But of course the line hasn't been there for good, almost 100 years, if not more. So I walked along the old line. Really, really interesting place to see. So if you get the chance, that video is going to be coming up very, very soon. And also I went off to Wetherall again to have a look at the railway line there. But another viaduct. I did Lamley Viaduct a few weeks ago. This time I've done Wetherall Viaduct. Or to give it its real name, Corby Bridge. Fantastic little place right beside the station. And uh, if you're scared of heights, it's a bit of a scary viaduct to go over. Especially the stairs at the side. But you'll find that on the video. So, thanks very much for watching this one, and uh, don't forget, if you enjoyed this, give me a thumbs up. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button underneath, because that will keep you in the list so you'll see all the videos that I put out. And if you get the chance, hit the little bell beside it, because that notifies you every time I upload a video onto YouTube. And if you can give me that thumbs up, I'd really appreciate it, because what that does is it gets YouTube to promote the videos to more and more people, so more people can see these videos. Thanks very much for watching. Once again, Brian James, the Micro Four Thirds guy. Really look forward to seeing you next time. And as I say, don't forget to look out for the next couple of videos, the, uh, the Dandy in Brampton and also Weatherall Viaduct. I'll see you on them. Bye-bye.